Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you much. Thank you so much for joining in on this presentation this evening. My name is Emily Carveth, and I'm a licensed master social worker in the state of Connecticut. I'm also a veterinary social worker and a therapist in private practice. And so for tonight, what I'll be sharing with you is my signature presentation called We Rise Together. And this is a seminar about understanding trauma and how it can impact us as veterinary professionals and some pathways to consider for our healing. Okay, and I'm just gonna give you a little bit of info about me before we start, and then I'll share my invitations into our learning space. Uh, so to give you a little backstory on me, um, I have been in the veterinary field since 2005 in a bunch of different roles as first as a receptionist or client liaison, um, and then I became cross-trained as a veterinary assistant. My dream as a child was to become a vet, and that was my goal for a really long time. Um, I worked in various practices in general practice and specialty in emergency medicine. And along the way, um, ever since I was a young person, I've uh, struggled with my own mental health. And um, there are lots of folks with mental health struggles in my family. And in my journey towards my own healing and self-awareness and growth, I was helped by some really beautiful therapists, specifically clinical social workers. So along the same time that I was in vet med, I started really getting interested in what it might be like to become a therapist, specifically a social worker. Um, and I was always really torn about, you know, how do I keep this? Um, how do I explore this new part of my life but while also keeping vet med a part of my life? And I really didn't know how to do that for a long time. And then my father introduced me, I think sent me an article on veterinary social work and it was like all the puzzle pieces came together and I knew that I had found my calling. So I went to grad school. I graduated from Fairfield University in Connecticut in 2022, so last year. And I started working pretty much immediately as the staff social worker at a large um, specialty and emergency hospital in Connecticut. And then, um, and that, you know, fulfilled my soul for a, quite a while. Um, I did experience some burnout of my own um, and through my exposure to the traumatic side of working as a veterinary social worker. So part of this is really a labor of love for me. These are the resources and the information that I'll share that have been personally very helpful for me in my own healing from ongoing trauma. Um, and so I really hope to, if nothing else with this presentation, normalize the reactions that you may be having to your work the things that you might be experiencing in your body, in your mind, in your spirit on a day-to-day -day basis sometimes in veterinary medicine and that you're truly not alone. Um, there can be a big stigma in veterinary medicine about against um, seeking help for mental health struggles. And I really hope to be part of those voices that help erase that stigma. Um, so with that all being said, I'm going to share with you my invitations for learning. So these invitations are not of my own creation. I firmly believe in honoring my teaching lineage and I want to be very transparent in that these invitations were gifted to me by my own clinical supervisor, the social worker that makes sure I'm an ethical and humane social worker. Her name is Tawana Woolfolk, and her practice is Sacred Ground Institute in West Haven, Connecticut. She um, aptly calls herself a doula for the soul. And so these are Tawana's teaching invitations that she kindly shared with me, and I'm going to invite them into our space together. So number one is to suspend the impulse to lead with criticism, judgment, and bias. And why might I be saying that? 
we all have biases. They're called implicit biases that we don't even know that we possess, or we may know as we develop our learning. But for a lot of us, they're um, deeply ingrained through messages that we've received from maybe our society, our culture, our family of origin. There can be lots of things that lots of biases that we can hold against maybe learning about trauma or mental health or um, systemic oppression. And um, this is just an invitation to perhaps consider if there are some biases that you're holding about this content area and just to honor what comes up for you and also an invitation to consider coming into the space with an open mind and heart. And then the second is to suspend the impulse to white knuckle your way through. And this is especially important if you are ever watching this presentation in person or during your work day. Whenever I'm teaching in person, I really make sure to remind my folks and my clients that I'm working with in private practice that it's really important to take care of your personal needs. So that means stop this presentation, get up, go to the bathroom, grab a snack, grab a drink of water, Whatever you need to make your learning space feel comfortable. Um, so some for some folks that can mean grabbing a blanket, maybe a candle that they love, you know, a stuffed animal to hold while they're listening. Because trauma, discussing trauma can be a really heavy topic for a lot of people, understandably so. And um, whatever you need to make your learning as um, safe in your body as possible, I invite you to do that. So please, if you need to pause this, and especially since this is a tender topic, and I will be bringing up some difficult things, um, if you need to step away from this learning space and take a pause and come back to it the next day, or not at all, I invite you to consider that too. Ultimately, your mental health and your personal safety is the most important thing to consider. And then my third invitation is to remember that lived experiences vary and each person's experience is unique and valid. And this is my teaching statement I'd like to share with you. As a social worker, I am guided by the principles of respect for the worth and dignity of every person and animal. I am dedicated to anti-oppressive and anti-racist practice and teaching, which in part means acknowledging my inherent privilege as a white cisgender person from an upper middle class economic background. I strive to center voices from different backgrounds than my own and acknowledge freely my teaching lineage. I believe in honoring both science and indigenous holistic ways of healing, which in my opinion are not mutually exclusive. I believe that teachers learn from their students and that feedback is absolutely essential in order for me to strengthen my offerings. I welcome questions and curiosity about any and all subjects I speak on. Um, and my contact info will be shared at the end of this presentation so you can get in touch with me with your questions and feedback and just reflections. I bring my whole self into our collective space and I invite you to do the same knowing that you have my respect, reverence, and trust. And I just want to take a brief moment to um, speak in memory of someone who is very, is very near and dear to my heart. Um, part of why I'm so passionate about the work that I do is um, I, among with many of our colleagues in, in Connecticut, lost one of us uh, to suicide. Um, her name was Vicki Howe, and um, she was just the light of our lives. You would speak to anyone that knew her, and um, I think they would say the same. And so much of what I do is because of her, in memory of her, and honoring her legacy. And if I can be one of those folks that helps someone not struggle as deeply as Vicki did. Um, I hope that my work will not be in vain. So I just want to take a brief pause to honor the life and work of Vicki Howe. Thank you for holding that space with me. So I just want to emphasize more than anything else, if you don't take away anything else from this presentation, know that you're not alone 
there are so many struggles we can face as we work as veterinary professionals. And my aim is to help you learn about why. Veterinary work is inherently trauma work. As veterinary professionals, we encounter trauma in many different forms. Our patients, our clients, ourselves, we all experience traumatic events frequently in the course of caring for animals. And I'm going to differentiate here between primary and secondary or vicarious trauma. You can hear secondary trauma and vicarious trauma, basically interchangeable terms for the same thing. So what do I mean when I talk about these two terms? Well, primary trauma is trauma that is created by directly experiencing pain and or the risk to our own life. This can mean for us as working veterinary professionals, injury in the line of duty. This could mean threatening behavior and physical violence from clients or colleagues. I just want to honor and acknowledge that um, that is a very real risk. And any information that I share that may pertain to um, violence from others, it is not an excuse for the behavior. It is just an explanation to give some context about what might be happening. And also when I talk about primary trauma, we need to think on multiple levels of ourselves and of our society. So this also means racial trauma. If we've experienced racial discrimination at any point in our life, some people experience racial discrimination absolutely every day and every moment of their lives. And that's really important for us to talk about when we think about primary trauma. I can be talking about interpersonal trauma. So if you or someone you love is the survivor of domestic violence, intimate, intimate partner violence, family violence, this is what I'm talking about. Physical trauma, maybe um, physical illness, um, again, injury in the line of duty, and then systemic trauma. This is when we perhaps were part of a marginalized population of people that has faced oppression from um, the structures and systems above us um, so from the government or um, perhaps our community institutions. Many people face this on an ongoing 24-7 basis. And it's really important to acknowledge that and just be thoughtful about that. And I'm also talking about ecological trauma. We are still in the midst of a multi-year global pandemic. And that in itself aside from everything else that's been going on in our world, has had a profound impact on all of us. Uh, whether we know whether we've gone through COVID ourselves, had family members or loved ones that have experienced the illness, and even just being in a world where a pandemic is happening can be profoundly traumatic for folks. And um, I always think that needs to be part of the conversation Ecological trauma can also mean if our uh, local environment has been devastated in some way. Um, wildfires, um, disaster, natural disasters. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about, and these are profoundly traumatic events for many, many people. And then especially pertinent to our line of work as veterinary professionals um, is the concept of secondary or vicarious trauma. And this is sometimes what folks don't talk about often enough, in my opinion. Secondary or vicarious trauma is trauma that is created in our own bodies by witnessing the traumatic experience of others. So animals or people or the planet. And in our line of work in vet med, what that most often means is us bearing witness to death, dying animals, animals that are very sick and, and facing potential death, and also witnessing the grief and emotional distress of others. If you've ever felt intense emotions as a result of seeing someone else in distress, there's nothing wrong with you. We have neurons in our brain called mirror neurons that are part of how we build relationships as social creatures. And they are the mirror neurons that help us feel empathy 
help us experience what another person might be experiencing. But this can also be deeply traumatic for folks. So perhaps for us seeing a client in deep distress over the loss of their beloved animal companion can be very much wired into our own system as traumatic. And what I really want you all to know that this is more common than you think. And so many of us blame ourselves for our trauma responses, but trauma and trauma responses are not created by choice. The wirings of our brains and our nervous systems prime us to detect threats. And I'll go into a, a, the biological basis of a little bit more later, but we're primed to detect threats and create adaptive, ingenious responses to potentially or directly threatening situations. So here's a great little infographic I found that explains this really well. How trauma affects the brain immediate, immediately. This is not my own content, um, but I'm very grateful for the original creator. So there's an old part of our brain called the amygdala. It's a, well, there's actually two. There's one amygdala on both sides of our brain, but we refer to them as a singular um, organ. Um, and I like to call the amygdala Amy. Again, not my original idea. There's a great therapist, Catherine Pittman, that um, does a lot of work in uh, writing about how to work with your amygdala. And she likes to call the amygdala Amy. And I just love that. So when Amy identifies a potential threat and she is working overtime to direct to detect threats, um, she Amy works to sound the alarm like a fire alarm by ap activating the side of our nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is like a gas pedal. Once it's pressed, it floods the body with stress hormones. So cortisol, adrenaline, um, norepinephrine is the same thing as adrenaline, and a lot of people are familiar with that. Um, this flooding of stress hormones puts our body into a state of fight or flight, causing several physiologic changes in the body and brain. And I'm going to go into a lot more detail on the next slide. So this slide is basically a chart of what nervous system activation can look like. And I am a big nerd about nervous systems and brains and the neurobiological basis of how we might show up in the world. So this is um, not my original work, um, but this is kindly borrowed from my teacher, Linda Tai of Collectively Rooted. Her, she is absolutely amazing. Um, please check her website out. Um, her, the organization that she's with is called Collectively Rooted, and I'm one of her students, um, and she has just been a game changer in my understanding of how all this stuff works. And then she adapted this content from another therapist, Pat Ogden, who is the originator of sensory motor psychotherapy. So she's also really worth looking into. So I'm basically going to kind of walk you through what this chart is talking about. If you notice on the left side, um, the different, the up and down arrows, so that's differentiating between the sympathetic nervous system. That's, so that's when, um, in a nutshell, our fight, flight, but there's more to it, responses are activated in response to um, a potential threat or stressor. So that's one side of our um, automatic nervous system. There's another side called the parasympathetic nervous system that I'll talk about in just a second. And a lot of how the nervous system gets activated and responds to threats and potential trauma um, has to do with the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the largest nerve in our body, and it, uh, what we call, innervates many, many different organs in the body. It's called the master nerve, and the word vagus um, means wanderer in Latin. And it was called that because it kind of wanders throughout the body, but it has so much to do with how our nervous, nervous system responds to stressful situations. Um, so basically what this is saying, if you look over to the left side, um, in between the dotted lines, this is where a, um, a trigger comes in, a stressor. And so what happens in response to a potential threat 
is our sympathetic nervous system starts to get more and more activated with energy. And so kind of as in, think of it like a roller coaster. So when you're first getting on a roller coaster, typically how most coasters start, <coughs> in my experience, is you're kind of going up and 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 up that first hill, right? Well, you got to go somewhere. So it gets to a peak and then it goes way, way down. This is sort of like that. So as our nervous system energy, as our sympathetic activation builds and builds and builds, we can go through several stages of nervous system activating, um, starting from fright, that kind of that feeling like <gasps> I've experienced something kind of scary and stressful. And where you see attachment cry, what that means is this is a lot of times when folks instinctively reach out to connect with others to help them. But sometimes maybe you're in a situation where you're not able to do that. Maybe you're in the midst of a four hour surgery and something, um, you know, a surgical complication happens and you have nowhere to go and nowhere to ask for help. Maybe you don't feel like you can do that at that time. You just have to act. So maybe your sympathetic nervous system activation keeps growing. So for most of us, that leads us into a state of panic. If you've ever had panic attacks, that's where stuff like this comes in. And then if the nervous system energy still doesn't have a place to go and it keeps rising, excuse me, I got a little bit of the hiccups, um, we can get into a really angry and rageful state. Because again, you think about the energy in our body and think about how you felt when you've ever been really, really angry. I bet you don't feel super tired at the moment. You're probably revved and raring to go. And that's because the energy in our nervous system is continuing to rise, rise, rise with nowhere to go to slough off the excess. Um, and then we meet, reach an ultimate state of nervous system activation, um, which is called the freeze response. And that, um, that can often be a state of terror for us. And as this is happening, I invite you to look at the text um, under where it says neuroception of danger. So what's happening inside of our brain while this activation is rising is the limbic system. That's an old part of our brain that's, again, evolved in the threat detection system. That really wakes up and turns on. But the prefrontal cortex, this front part of our brain, this is one of the last areas of the brains to evolve in terms of human evolution and also our own development. Our prefrontal cortex typically does not, this is not a hard and fast rule, but does not finish evolving and developing until we're about 25 years old. So if you've ever known an adolescent, a teenager that is really struggling with impulses and decision-making, really, they're not trying to be a bad kid. Um, you know, they're just, their, their decision-making center hasn't fully finished, you know, forming yet. Um, and so that part of our brain, which is associated with logic and making decisions, um, concrete actions shuts off. So if you ever look at brain scans of trauma survivors, especially folks who are struggling with PTSD, when they're having a flashback, the prefrontal cortex, which is previously lit up, goes completely dark. It's like a light switch almost gets flipped, flipped off. And also an area of our brain called the Broca's area turns off. Now, this is one of our language centers in the brain. So if you've ever been so activated and so stirred up that you literally can't form words, that's what's happening here. It's because the higher uh, brain regions are kind of offline right now. And the really old, like, like lizard brain parts are taking over and we are running basically on instinct at this point. Um, and so one of my other teachers, Eric Gentry always says like rage is just basically the manifestation of nervous system energy with nowhere else to go. Um, and so we may enter at the ultimate peak, a state of freeze. And some of us can be stuck in this place for years. We can kind of be hyper on or a hyper freeze. And we're, and sometimes what that can mean is we may look very stiff and immobile and stuck, but inside we're just buzzing, buzzing, buzzing with nervous energy. I like to call that anxiety paralysis, anxiety paralysis. So if you ever feel like you just can't get off the couch, but inside you are feel like you're running on a hamster wheel, that's kind of what I'm talking about here. 
And then for a lot of us and for a lot of mammals in general, once we reach that peak of ultimate terror, then it's like our, the roller coaster peaks and comes crashing down. And this is when the um, side of our vagus nerve called the dorsal vagal side really becomes activated and turned on. And this is when most of us shut down. So if you watch animals in the wild that are being chased, a lot of times what you'll see happening is they're being chased, chased, chased. They're running, running, running. And then maybe the predator is getting really close and all of a sudden they will play dead. Most of the times that is not a conscious response. That is their survival strategy. That is the dorsal vagal branch of the nervous system of the vagus nerve activating and shutting it down um, to basically play dead and um, be safe. And it's the only available option. So for us, a lot of times what that looks like is we are completely collapsed at the end of the day. Say you've had a crazy shift and it's been nothing but emergency cases and crashes and euthanasias and everything going on all at once. And then you get home and you crash out on the couch or your bed and you sleep for 10 hours afterwards. That's what this is. So just to normalize that for you, I can't tell you how many veterinary professionals I've talked to that said, you know, I'm really mad at myself because when I get home after a tough shift, I just don't want to do anything. I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to see anyone. I can't even cook myself dinner. Well, it's not your fault. It's not something you're doing maliciously. This is a trauma response. And I am making some generalizations here, but this is what applies for the majority of people who are activated in this way. And this is an even more in-depth slide. And what Linda decided to do that was really helpful in terms of my own learning and maybe helpful for you is kind of track um, psychiatric diagnoses along this nervous system activation arc and downward slope. And so a lot of times, and this isn't true for everyone, I get, just got some great feedback today about this. So diagnoses can be a funny thing for a lot of people. For some of us, they may bring real hope and a sense of safety because it's a name for the things that we've been experiencing. It can be a huge source of comfort, and that is amazing. If that is helpful for you, then please, you know, lean into this and I invite you to deepen your learning about this. Um, but then for some folks, receiving a psychiatric diagnosis can be triggering in of itself. And sometimes it makes us feel like there's something wrong with us. But with this slide, what I hope to help you really understand is the biological and neurological, there's a little fly in the room, um, underpinnings of some of these diagnosis, diagnoses that we may talk about and may be given to us. For example, if your nervous system is more towards the um, hyperactivated side of things, the going up and up and up the roller coaster, that could look like a diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder. That could look like um, diagnoses, what we call diagnoses of coping. So a lot of folks who are anxiously hardwired by nature and tend to stay like upregulated all the time can really struggle with um, not knowing how to soothe and calm themselves because most of us are not taught this as kids. You know, we're just starting these conversations in our field, even in particular. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just going to take a sip of water. Okay, sometimes when I take when I talk too long, I get a little bit of a scratchy throat. And so again, just to normalize maybe some diagnoses that you might have been given, hopefully this helps you understand what's going on behind the scenes. <coughs> Excuse me. So I just invite you to consider if you've experienced any of the physical symptoms that are listed here on this chart, such as, you know, feeling really, like we talked about before, feeling really tired at the end of the day or most days, feeling numb, feeling disconnected. And um, <clears throat> for a lot of folks, when we're kind of hypo aroused 
for a long period of time, what can happen is we start to lose interest in the things that we really used to love and enjoy. And so a lot of times when folks are in this state for a long period of time and you're seeing my body react to a tickle <coughs> in my throat, so I'm just kind of coping as I go along. So <laughs> you get to see me react in real time to my own body changes. Um, this can be labeled or diagnosed as depression. And then again, if you're more on the upper hyper regulated side of the scale, this can be look like being diagnosed as having panic attacks, or maybe if you really struggle with the rage side of things, you could be diagnosed, especially as kiddos is with oppositional defiant disorder. So again, I, if nothing else, I'm just going to take off my glasses for the rest of this here. Excuse me. Um, we really just, sometimes it's helpful to have some words to put on what we're experiencing. And I hope to give you greater context with all of this. And so now I want to talk about some specific challenges that we can encounter in veterinary medicine. Um, these can be a part of working in healthcare in general, but I've seen over the course of my career so far that this, these can really come up for veterinary professionals. Um, the first I want to talk about is imposter syndrome. And this is an overwhelming, just pervasive feeling of feeling incompetent. So a lot of folks really struggle with this in vet med at the beginning of their careers, but it can really happen at any time. And I describe it as the feeling of it's only a matter of time before they find out I'm a fraud. Oh man, have, do I identify with this personally, both as a veterinary professional and a therapist. I think we can be very hard on ourselves in general as professionals, you know, and to an extent, I really understand because we are, you know, talking about a field of work where patients' lives are at risk and at stake because of what we do. Um, but sometimes this can really set up a tough time for us. Um, and an ongoing feeling of imposter syndrome can be very traumatic for us. And so a lot of times what happens is if you're struggling with imposter syndrome, when people praise you, it may feel very unsettling and off. And that's something called cognitive dissonance. And that means when your internal experience is very, very different than the information that you're receiving around you, that set up cognitive dissonance and that can feel deeply uncomfortable. So a lot of times if you struggle with, maybe you feel worse after people praise you, again, it's not your fault. A lot of people struggle with this and we just, you know, maybe don't talk about it enough. Um, you know, a lot of us should all over ourselves like, oh, I should be feeling better because people are telling me I'm doing amazing. Well, not if your internal experience is so very different. Um, so I just, again, want to provide some context for what you might be experiencing if you struggle with this. And um, in a similar vein is many vet med folks struggle with perfectionism. Um, so this is striving to be perfect no matter what. And a feeling of failure when even the smallest mistakes are inevitably made. This is something I've had to grapple with because everyone makes mistakes. <coughs> Excuse me. None of us are perfect. Literally everyone is fallible, but we can be really hard on ourselves and say, that's not possible for me because I work in a medical profession where I have to take care of patients and lives are on the line and I get it. I really, really do. But um, <clears throat> continuing to struggle with these feelings um, can really set us up for struggle. And so we can feel like, oh, if it's not perfect, I'm not worthy of support, of care, of validation. And that's where things get really tricky for us. And then also I want to briefly touch on compassion fatigue. Some people also call this burnout, although burnout's just a little bit different, but they do kind of go hand in hand. 
Compassion fatigue is what we we call the cost of caring. And this is something that's unique to folks who are in a helper role. Um, So vet med, doctors, nurses, clergy, firefighters, EMS folks, we can all be susceptible to compassion fatigue. And compassion fatigue has very real mental, emotional, and physical effects, such as feeling exhausted all the time, difficulty focusing on your work, and a really profound lack of desire to do caring work. So again, if you're struggling with this, this is not your fault. This is not something you've done wrong. If you take nothing away, please remember that, that, you know, we can hold such self-blame and it's really misplaced when this can be a very natural consequence of the work that we do. And I want to talk about a couple of more common challenges that we may experience. Um, this is one that gets talked about a little bit more often in human medicine, but is really, really prominent for most of us as veterinary professionals, and that's called moral distress. And that means when we are experiencing mental, emotional, spiritual pain, when our values don't match with others' behavior. So what can that look like for us? This often occurs when we disagree with clients' decisions for their pets. That can, We can really struggle with that. I've seen my beautiful veterinary technicians, veterinary nurses really struggle deeply <coughs> with this. And I get it because a lot of times you all and the vet assistants are doing the super hands-on nitty-gritty nursing care And then if maybe the owner makes a decision that, you know, you don't agree with, this can be deeply hurtful and traumatic for you. (coughs) Again, excuse me for all of my bodily reactions. So this can also happen when we disagree with our colleagues um, about medical decisions they've made. That can come into play too. And then I briefly mentioned burnout before, but I'll touch on it here. Burnout is what happens when we experience mental, emotional, and physical exhaustion, when we really feel or know that our environment doesn't support us. And so this can be things feeling like I'll never get my needs met here. Things will never change. Thinking that things will never change frequently may be a sign of burnout. And again, not your fault. Um, Very natural to feel this way, especially if we're in a system that is not well set up or equipped to support us mentally, emotionally, and physically. So I think a lot of us vet men folks can identify with that in some way. And then another thing I wanted to touch on is sensory overwhelm. Uh, Sensory overwhelm is uh, something that can be especially true for folks on the autism spectrum or highly sensitive people. So what I'm talking about is nervous system overload when you're exposed to lots of stimuli. And so that can be loud sounds, bright lights, stinky smells, sound familiar, basically any veterinary hospital life I've ever worked in. So This is just to validate if this is happening to you and also your colleagues may be experiencing this. And this can lead to things like confusion, feeling irritable, feeling very anxious, panic, and exhaustion. Um, So I just, I, I think that's really not discussed often enough and vet men want to bring attention to it. So I've just given you a whole bunch of knowledge. So what do we do now? How do you move forward? How do we support our healing and the healing of others? One concept I wanted to talk about when you're thinking about supporting others is co- is the concept of co-regulation. And this is a biological calming mechanism that often happens naturally between humans. Um, <clears throat> This is what happens when one nervous system that's in a safe and connected state helps another comes into a safe and connected state through our mirror neurons and behaviors. It's not something we actively do unless we are trying to make it happen. It's something we create space for. 
Um, so I just want to share that safety, feelings of safety is very subjective and uh, unique to the person. <clears throat> so the following may feel safe for some people, but not others. Touch or lack of touch, physical closeness, physical distance, quiet, noise, types of music, new things, familiar things, stimulation or lack of stimulation. <clears throat> So reducing triggers and increasing safety creates space for co-regulation. Um, so if you're supporting someone who's in distress, a lot of times learning some things that can calm and soothe your own nervous system can be very helpful in regulating someone else because, because of those mirror neurons, we kind of borrow each other's nervous systems. It's something I think about all the time as a trauma therapist is with my own body, with the sounds of my voice, keep um, creating safety for my clients. And so this is something that we can do for each other and for our clients. Um, so typically lowering the pitch of our voices, like I'm doing now, slowing down our speech, um, keeping our shoulders open, <clears throat> lowering the volume of our voice, um, and sometimes for me, it's even angling my position when I'm sitting next to someone. So not sitting directly across from them, but kind of at a diagonal with them. Often that can create feelings of safety. Um, <clears throat> so again, these are just all things to think about as you consider supporting someone else. We're social creatures. We're wired to connect with others. And then again, polyvagal, as you might think of from the name, it all has to do with the vagus nerve. <clears throat> and then I'd like to share with you some techniques um, such as self-holding and self-swaddling that I've learned from Linda that can support us through traumatic times and remind our body that we're safe. So I'm going to play a little bit of my teacher, Linda Ties video on this topic, if I can get it to play. Let's see. I can't get it to play, but um, my contact, if you're watching this presentation recorded, uh, please know that my contact info is at the end of the presentation and I will happily share this video with you. Uh, Linda has given us all permission to share. <clears throat> um, so just some quick grounding skills that I can share with you that sometimes help. Um, you can ground with your five senses and so that um, a lot of folks have heard of the 54321 technique. So that can mean um, finding five things we can see four things we can hear, three things we can touch, two things we can smell, and one thing we can taste. And so utilizing our five senses can really help us come back into our bodies in a safe way. And above all else, like I've mentioned throughout this presentation, I just really want you to know that needing support and help and asking for support and help is not a sign of weakness like so many of us in vet men think it is. It's a survival skill. Humans are social creatures by nature and we are wired to connect. And so we can do lots of self-soothing and self-regulation. That is all very important for our own healing, but we also heal in community as well. It's, and I just want to point out, it's okay to tell others how we prefer to be supported. So for some folks that might mean physical touch, some folks that might mean telling the person that we think that they're doing great, Maybe it means getting them some food or a cup of water. Sometimes it's just letting them be alone for a minute and knowing that we're right outside the door. Sometimes it's running some errands for people. And so it's okay to ask someone how they'd like to be supported. In fact, I encourage it. And then if you're the one that's needing care, I encourage you to be honest with people about how you like to be supported. And I just want to share some final other like alternative pathways to um, support your healing. So <clears throat> for most of us in met, vet med, it's really helpful to talk with someone who just gets it. Um, peer support can be so invaluable for our healing. And I want to 
point out two specific organizations, the Veterinary Mental Health Initiative, or VMHI, and Not One More Vet, or NOMV, uh, both offer peer support groups. I highly encourage you checking out those programs. Um, and it might be time to consider speaking with a counselor. It's There's never a bad time to do that. And it is very normal to speak with a couple of counselors, therapists, before you find the one that's right for you. It's almost like interviewing for a job. Um, it can take a couple of tries to find the right fit, and that's okay. And us therapists, we encourage our clients to ask us questions. With my own folks that I see, I always offer a free like intro call so they can ask me questions about how I work and how I show up as a therapist, um, even what kind of insurance I take, because that's like logistical, practical questions. And that way they can get a sense of me before we really start working together of if I might be a good fit for them and they're a good fit for me. Um, so I really encourage you to talk to folks that offer a free intro call if you're a little bit nervous about getting started. Um, and a lot of us don't really know where to start with finding a therapist. I recommend the sites Psychology Today and Therapy Den. They're kind of like Google for therapists. You can search by your area, what insurances folks take, and um, Therapy Den in particular can help you find therapists that are allied with your identity or your values. Um, for example, I identify as LGBTQ and I work with a lot of folks in the LGBTQ community and I'm able to make that very clear on my Therapy Den profile. Um, and that helps me connect with folks who are interested in working with an LGBTQ identified counselor. Um, and so whatever resource you seek out for your healing, just I would invite you to ask for yourself, who or what do I want in my care web? And I love the concept of a care web. It's like, what's your network that you want around you? And that's not my own concept. I completely adapted that from one of my favorite teachers. Her name is Umu Silla. Um, and she's on Instagram is connect with Umu. I highly, highly encourage you to check out her work and consider taking her radical mental health first aid course. It's amazing. Excuse me there. Um, and beyond that, just asking yourself, what do you need to feel safe and supported in your work? And I'm going to leave you with these words and then share my resources with you. So this is from Audre Lorde, who was a Black feminist that is responsible for much of the feminist scholarship that we have today. And as a social worker, I am deeply inspired by her. She was such a powerful agent for social change throughout her life and certainly an inspiration of mine. And I want to share these words with you. And these are from um, her cancer journals. What are the words you do not have yet? What do you need to say? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day and attempt to make your own until you will sicken and die of them still in silence? We have been socialized to respect fear more than our own need for language. I began to ask each time, what's the worst that could happen to me if I tell the truth? So I invite you to consider yourself if you're really struggling with the idea of asking for help or telling someone what's going on, what's the worst that could happen to you if you told your truth. And lastly, here's my resources page. So we have um, my teacher Linda's website, lynda-tai.com, my clinical supervisor and mentor site, um, sacredgroundinstitute.com, Umu Silla's Instagram, connect with Umu, and then some books I recommend. Um, these are all beautiful books. Um, Laura Vander Newt Lipsky's Trauma Stewardship was a lifesaver for me when I was first learning about my own trauma and healing. Um, I also highly recommend Janina Fisher's book, The Living Legacy of Trauma. She also has a great workbook and flip chart that goes along with her book. And then uh, one of our own, Sonia Olson, Dr. Sonia Olson, uh, wrote an amazing book that I am still getting through because it's very dense and packed with, inf dense in the best way, and packed with information, um, creating well-being and building resilience in the veterinary profession. I highly recommend checking that out. 
And lastly, if you can, if you'd like to connect with me after watching this presentation, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, you can reach out to me at emily at spokenbalance.com or at my website, spokenbalance.com slash emily. That's the website for my therapy practice that I work for. So if you live in the state of Connecticut and are interested in working with me as your counselor, I invite you wholeheartedly to reach out to me. And these resources are not on this page, but I'm just going to voice them here. Um, if you are a management member and you're looking for a veterinary social worker to consult with, um, just about different building different programs and inclusivity, um, psychological safety. You can also reach out to me um, at emily at boopveterinaryconsulting.com. That's my non therapy veterinary social work arm of my work. So I thank you all so very much for your time, for your patience with my own body reactions. I know we had quite a journey tonight. Um, this is really a labor of love for me, and I'm so excited that you were present to for this information. So please reach out to me at any time. Take care of yourself. This can be difficult subject matter to talk about and think about. Give yourself some time to process, and again, always ask for the help that you need. Take care. Bye now.